Hey guys, so what's been happening in the hobby this week? Well, uh, I thought we'd do a little first impressions or a bit of a, a you know, an early review of the new AOS 3 uh, core rulebook. So it's uh, coming up for pre-order on Saturday. And um, yeah, we've all had a chance to, I guess, look at some of the, the articles that they've released on the Warmer Community page. And uh, now they've very kindly allowed us to download a version of the core rules uh, for free. And if you haven't already done that yet, uh, go to the, the Age of Sigma website or the Weimar Community page article that talks about downloading this. Click on the link and go get yourself a copy because it's, um, you know, it's free and you get a chance to really see what the new game is going to be like. And I think that's a really cool thing. So, you know, it's the actual pages we're seeing. The real rule book is not just like some sort of, you know, you know, lame kind of, uh, you know, Excel spreadsheet version of the of the rule book. It's the the real thing, so that's good. And got this nice uh, bit of art on the cover here, and yeah. So let's get into it. I guess um, this will be from I guess an old fantasy player coming back into AOS's view on on this game and um, and what I think of it. Uh, you know, I've been in the hobby for a long time. You know, you know, since the eighties and yeah, I haven't played any of the AOS game yet, but um, I've played plenty of, uh, obviously, 40K, the new 40K stuff since 8th edition, and um, obviously back in the day I played a lot of uh, Warhammer Fantasy, so I'm plenty plenty familiar with uh, with the way Games Workshop makes games and all that kind of stuff, so I just thought this might be interesting if you're new coming back in or you're, yeah, you're just sort of getting back into AOS or... or you know, into the hobby in general uh, from a previous time. This might be interesting for you. If you're looking for a hardcore uh, meta analysis, there's obviously better channels for that if you're if you're looking for that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I have enough experience to to give my two cents on it, I think. And um, yeah, so that's going to be cool. So let's get into it. So we'll come down here. And I think the, the first thing off really is, um, we'll just move it down to uh this page here so the unit coherency so yeah i mean you know the when, when i first sort of saw all this stuff and when i first decided you know i, I think i want to get back into into fantasy and you know try this aos stuff out um you know initially at least for aos 2 it felt very um confusing to say the least and anyone who's been a, an old fantasy player or something like that that's looking at aos you know you're going to find there's a lot of confusing things now obviously if you play 40k uh, like i do then you know some of it is obviously familiar you know they're playing a skirmish a skirmish got style game they're on round bases you know it's basically 40k without the shooting for the most part and and the armies that do have shooting pretty much excel and i and i saw that straight away and you know, right now in the meta and previously, who are the, the top six factions in AOS or whatever, they're all the ones that are capable of, of really good shooting and a lot of maneuverability. So maneuvering uh, and, and, and that flexibility and shooting is is paramount to, to winning games of AOS as far as I can see. Um, you know, the other armies that, that can do well maybe spike, you know, very, very you know, for like a month or two, and then they, they drop out, you know, when, they're, when their iron book drops or whatever, and people trying to, you know, work with the meta and stuff. But really, the ones that are always shining are the ones that from their very core, their very structure is all about uh, flexible movement and being very adaptive and um and 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 a lot of range uh power right and those that can't do that or don't play in all the phases of the game they tend to suffer and you see that in 40k as well so 40k is very much those armies that are the most maneuverable the most flexible with um you know that efficiency there and and good range projection of of, of their of their damage and power you know your you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna be on top, and and that's and that's the case for this type of skirmish game. So the moment I saw iOS, I was like, okay, so you know which one should I pick, and all that kind of stuff, and you know, that was my initial sort of thought about it. But I was like looking at the books, and I couldn't really figure out what I wanted to do. And you know, there's a lot of like weird stuff about this game that's like very different to old days, right? You've got um, set unit sizes that just duplicate in size as you get make them bigger. You don't have like individual points values for for models, so you can't have you know any size unit that you want within the requirements of that unit. You have to have a certain amount and then it doubles basically it's whatever the box is is what the unit size is and then you just double that pretty much for the most part 
and you know that's okay that's very convenient i guess and fits in with you know games workshop's way of like selling stuff that makes it easier and so i can see the value in it but coming from 40k where you get to really minutia make your list you know that list building uh part of the the whole thing which is really important and, and fun and, and enjoyable you know you might drop one model out here to get the squeeze in the points to do something else or whatever and and a lot of the time units that generally come in three if they're going up to six normally units like that in multi-wound units their sweet spot isn't actually six it's usually something like four or five often right and um, at least in 40k and i would imagine that a lot of the units in in aos for elite units that are coming in threes probably four or five is the best size uh and certainly as we see say going into the unit coherency rules that are that are now uh in aos you know uh which is very similar to 40k you do want things at five models or less and so a lot of these units are on big bases uh are going to suffer for that right so you know all those kinds of things and and but still, you know, I, I could put my, I could put that aside, that sort of small little kind of thing of wanting to be able to pay individual points for things and, and, and sort of assess the game more on its whole and, and think about it. Um, you know, what is it giving that 40k doesn't have? And, and is that interesting? Do I want to play both games and all that kind of stuff? And I'm the sort of person that when I go all in, I go all in, you know what I mean? Like I played like all their games and all that sort of stuff. Like once I decide to do, do a game system, I'm just going to, I'm just going to play it all right. Or you know, um, you know, I don't go halfway. So I was trying to find the way in. What was the key? What was the thing that was going to really unlock this game for me? And really it's come down to, you know, although I'd chosen at the start of the year to get into AOS, I was still sort of lukewarm about it. But now that I've been buying models and slowly painting them and getting into it, and now we see this new AOS 3 coming out, you know, it's, it's finally looking like a game I'm actually happy to play. You know, so my first reaction is uh, from all of this is that this looks good. Um, the the book is made well. It's written well for the most part. It, there's a lot of good clarification in there. Um, it feels like a pretty solid set of rules, much like eighth edition to ninth edition. You know, they were really like uh, for forty k. That's really like crystallized like quite a good set of rules yes there's still problems with army army books that come out that spike and become really dominant but that's a different issue but the core rules of the game itself uh, are, are pretty good I, i'm really enjoying it i love the layers of of tactics that go on that you're not just playing the game on the board you've got all this like you know strategy stratagems and so on command points to spend on stuff to to add further layers of synergy you've got a whole range you know of, of different levels of strategy going on that aren't just about just simply moving models on on the table so i love all that i love that it's got these kind of almost like a card game element even though there's there's not exactly cards but you've got the card game element on top of the board game thing and that's what initially drew me back into this hobby was seeing eighth edition 40k and seeing all the cards and the stratagems and going like yes it's it's combining my two great loves you know tabletop stuff and and card games you know what i mean and putting them together basically um and you know, it works really well because it, it adds so much to your army list building. You, you can, you know, you can tech for that, you know, all the different kinds of things. And one of the key things is about like, you know, your structures that you're, that you're building into detachments and so on in 40k. Well, now we see um, a streamlining of core battalions uh, in, in AOS, which is much better because one of the biggest confusing things that I always found was looking at these books and trying to figure out how to make your army list. It just wasn't intuitive. You know, you're looking one bit for a battalion there and then you're going back over this section and then you're flipping through here and then you're going back to the last page to find some specific wording on one, you know, unit entry that, 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 you know, marks them out for a certain type of buff or bonus or whatever it is. And you're going back and forth all the time. It's really, really difficult to really understand what was going on, you know, really from, from, and this is coming from someone who's got like 30 years or whatever in, in this type of tabletop stuff. And, you know, it still was really quite unintuitive and, and, and not very, not very clean. But now that you've got, that was the exact opposite, um, by the way, going into 40K, it was like a fish to water. I could see it straight away. I knew what to do. 40K, 
for all its changes, really hasn't changed that much from the early days. You know, the, the core principles of how that game is, is put together is still pretty much there. And I understood exactly what was going to be good, what wasn't, you know, how to build your list correctly, all that sort of stuff. That there, There really hasn't been much change, to be perfectly honest. It still plays exactly like it did in third edition or whatever, it really. You know, for, for a lot of it, for a lot of the key components of that game, it, it's still actually kind of understandable. Obviously, it does play differently now, all that kind of stuff, as I've just said all the layers of synergies and, and tactics and stuff but you know if you've come from that generation like 20 years ago and you looked at 40k now you'd easily be able to pick it up it wouldn't be confusing to you at all like you know you you play one game and you'd you'd know exactly what what's going on you wouldn't even you barely have to read the rule book like that's 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 how close it is to the feeling and the flavor of, of that game what what would happen is as you play more you realize that there's a lot more depth there and there's a lot more you know your skill cap is high and you know to get really good at the game that's when everything starts to open up and become the nuance of the game game is is very different to, to to the old game but the overall broad picture of what you're looking at is is basically very very similar however aos is not you know yes the armies generally are like they were then you know high elves are still high elves even though they're called lumineth you know and they sort of still have the same kind of i guess flavor or or thing that they do well you know they're still good at magic and shooting and all that stuff you know um undead are still undead you, you raising stuff you know that those core principles of what these armies are kind of are still the same but they do definitely play very differently and the composition and the points values and everything is very different and the just the yeah the the builds really look quite different they're sort of um yeah, it's it, it's a different it's a different beast for sure than than, than the old days, and, and then because it's in that skirmish formation, you know, you're not looking at like the the frontages and you know flanks and and rear charges and all that kind of stuff. And psychology is a different kind of beast in this. It's more just down to like leadership checks and losing losing models. You're not like you know fear and terror was such a massive part of of old school fantasy and nowadays that's not really a thing exactly you know you still have battle shock and things like that but it's it's more i guess it's more closer to 40k right so you're not you're not getting that type of thing so you know there's there's a whole different kind of feel to what's happening in this game and so that takes a bit of time to get used to but i can say that like looking at this new new set of rules it definitely um is a lot clearer and, and part of that is things like the the core battalion really the core battalion thing is what uh really for me anyway really clears up a lot of the 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 confusion about how to write a good list for for competitive play or match play or even casual games that you're going to play in a match play format you know what i mean which is you know i i would say more often than not um, the best way to play the game because it's the most fair for both sides when you're playing more narrative games or whatever you know there's going to be imbalances there that, that might be a bit unfair, especially if you have more experience than your opponent. As long as both of you are, you know, you're just going for the story and all that sort of stuff, that's great. But generally speaking, if you just want to play a game, you know, it's nicer when both sides are, are, are on, an, on a, I guess, a presumed fairer footing, even though we know army, army books and so on can be broken and all that stuff. But generally speaking, you know, same points, it's going to be okay. And um, yeah, that, that really clears up a lot for me. So I think that is, is probably the biggest single thing for this edition that, and, and the, the book itself and how it's worded and how, how they're writing it out. And um, some of the, yeah, some of those nuances and changes within the book that help to, you um, yeah, just give it a, a bit better feeling. The only thing I would say that's a little clunky that that doesn't really work so much, although we'll see what happens with new wall scrolls, is this coherency thing, which we'll talk about now. So it's it's using uh, the new, you know, the 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 40k version now of coherency, which is that two to five models. Um, if we take a look here, so uh, I'll just read it out. I don't want to go through this in like massive detail because, as I said, there's other meta meta channels that are going to do this better. But essentially, two to five models, you're unaffected by um, by this kind of rule that's going to happen in this second part of the rule here. And if you're over five, so six or more models, then you're going to be affected. Essentially, it, it, it's, it's basically saying that, um, you know, if you've got six or more models, then each model in your unit has to have two other models that are within one inch of, of, of each of another model. So it's all like little triangles, right? So that's pretty much all it is. And if you don't have that, each model that that, that isn't within two 
other models within one inch or whatever, then you're going to start losing models until it becomes coherent. So that's that's what's in 40k right now. Um, the reason why this is very different to 40k and why it impacts the game so much is because AOS has reach. It's you know that's pretty much the simple thing. So if you're five models or under, you don't get affected by this, right? So um, but if you're over it, then you are. And the problem with 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 reach is that. If you're on a larger size base, even a 32 mil base or and above, you know, which a lot of stuff is moving towards 32 mil bases, they're getting bigger, the models. So, you know, and you only got a one inch reach. So your front rank is in and then your model behind is probably not going to be able to reach the thing that you're fighting. Whereas in 40K, that's not how that works, right? Nothing has reach in 40K. You, um, the model that's in contact is in combat and the one behind only has to be within an inch of its own of, of, of a friendly model that's in combat and then and then you're going to get in, right? So that effectively is giving your back rank like a three inch reach, essentially, more or less, two and a half inch reach, three inch reach. So you, you never have that problem of, of staying, one, coherent in, in, in the unit as it fights, as it piles in and fights, and two, um, being able to reach and get the most of your unit into combat and fighting. So it's it's a big deal because it's going to reduce the number of attacks you're getting when, when you're charging in um, and if, the, if things have smaller reach, and most things do. However, we are seeing some units getting two-inch reach like these, um, the new the the uh, Vindictors or whatever for the, the Stormcasting, they've got a two-inch reach and the, the gut guys, the, the, um, the cruel boys, with the spears, they also have a two inch reach. So maybe they're going to start moving a lot of your, your key battle line units to having two inch reaches so that you can, um, use them more effectively because that's going to remove a bit of that problem of not being able to, um, get in on the second rank. Right. So that, that, that's a, that's a pretty big deal. And what that, what that really means, I guess, is that, you know, you're going to have more bunched up units in, 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 in closer formations essentially. And with, you know, all of the characters' abilities being like wholly within and stuff like that, that's also forcing more clumping and, and closer together, which is really funny because this game was designed to move away from, you know, uh, rank and file, regiment style, you know, combat like all fantasy was, you know, block units. And really th this coherence, coherency rule coupled with the wholly within rule basically forces you into playing old school fantasy. So anyone that was <laughs> that was on the fence about AOS and really want to just play old school fantasy, you are technically doing that now. You're just playing fantasy and that no one seems to, no one's actually, I haven't heard anyone comment on this yet, but essentially Essentially what you're doing is playing fantasy. They've tr tricked you into playing a skirmish game that looks like a skirmish game, but you're really just playing rank and file um, fantasy, but not on square bases. Because that's essentially what you're going to have to do for the most part is your units are going to be in these, you're going to have to have them on trays. So trays are all a thing, right? So you're still using trays, just like the old square ones. And you're going to be, you're going to be, but it's going to be more circular, you know, uh, formations rather than, or sort of, you know, rounded rectangles or whatever, rather than um, squares. That's pretty much all that is for for larger units anyway. It's that's how it's going to have to be, and you have to be quite close up. So and you and in heroes are going to be close to units, just like they were in old fantasy. You'd have them inside the unit and stuff like that. Here you're doing the same sort of thing. So you're basically playing fantasy again. They've they've basically moved it straight across to that. The only way that'll change is if they increase reaches of of, of um, models. You know, reaching you know, for especially for the larger stuff. So 32 mil and above. It doesn't really affect the smaller base size, but anything from 32 mil and above, it's going to affect. So yeah, that's just my, I suppose, my big take on that is that we're basically playing fantasy now. And so I certainly understand this now, but it's also pushing for most players that like the skirmish formation format. It's pushing most of the meta, I would imagine, to an MSU style uh, build, because unless they increase reaches, most competitive you know, level armies aren't going to want to be dealing with too much of this this um, coherency problem because you're going to lose too many models. You don't want to be just, you know, willy nilly taking models off just to get back into coherency. It's that's going to, you know, do you tons of damage if you're in a tournament or whatever. You don't want to have that. So, I think a lot of builds are going to look for more elite style armies with where they can play in five models and it's fine you know, or less, and have lots of those units. Uh, so I don't see any problem with doing that. You know, I was thinking about uh, Black Kings and that, you know, how everyone takes that sort of like Black King list where it's like 45 Black Kings. You know, I'm wondering like, what would be, can you just flip it and just do like, you know, whatever it is, eight or nine units of five, you know, would that be a problem? I don't know. But, you know, that'd be, in some ways, that'd be really powerful because you'd be able to claim everything on the board 
um, you know, and with the new rules for like the certain, you know, there are certain synergies there with, you know, retreating or, or, or fleeing and then being able to counter charge. There's a whole bunch of like, you know, little tactics you could employ to maximize that and not worry about having only five, you know, there, there's, there's some interesting builds there, I think, for MSU style stuff that, that some armies would actually do quite well, I think, in that format. And I'm just thinking about Black Kings about that and thinking, like, would that be a thing? Would there be some rule where you can't take that many? I don't know. Maybe there's, like, a rule of three thing for that stuff. I'm not sure yet because I haven't been to an AOS tournament, so I don't know what their kind of rules for that sort of thing would be. But, you know, there are some interesting kind of ideas for some of the elite stuff that might work quite well. If the whole meta is MSU, then having five in a unit of something like a Black King would probably be fine because you're probably not going to be versing anything too big anymore. And we'll see that further down with unit sizes and stuff. But anyway, I've been waffling about this too much, but this is the main thing that I guess I wanted to talk about with this, with this rules is that that's really a key component. And the core battalion is, is another re uh, really big one. And coupled with that sort of stuff and all the holy withins and everything, you are playing a kind of fantasy game again. It's kind of a little bit more like that now. So that's that's just one of those things that I thought was interesting. So let's move on and we'll have a little look at, um, here we go. So we've got the, the hero phase and these heroic actions. So we've all seen this. I'm not going to go too more into it because there's articles that already show all this. But essentially your hero is going to be doing more. Your monsters are going to, there's also the monster reaction one as well, the table for them doing actions. And, you know, it's by phase. So both you and your opponent are going to be doing them you know, um, whoever's turn it is, you're still, you're both going to be um, acting even in your opponent's turn. So you're going to have these kind of things going on. So CP is very important. You're going to be using these things to, to do these types of abilities and so on. And, you know, the, the finest hour obviously is the big pick. And so you've got all this stuff here where you're going to be doing a bunch of actions. And I, I like all that. I think, you know, tactically that's all great. It is going to slow the game down a bit initially, but I think, I think you'll get used to it and it'll be fine. It is a bit more bookkeeping, but overall I like all this. So as I said before, when I was getting back into 40 K, I love that it was getting more complicated with the layers of, of strategy on top. And I like the idea that this is also getting the same kind of layers of strategy so they don't give you as many cp for like let's say stratagems like you do in 40k but instead you're getting more utility with these options because you're getting to use them in both players turns and stuff like that it's more nuanced you've got like more ability to get these out at specific phases of the case so you've got like it's it's more complicated because normally 40k it's then they're really confined to like a couple of phases they're not really like doing anything like crazy but here you've got so many more phases that all this stuff can interact with that it makes it really interesting so you know the other the other big impact here is the general's handbook and the fact that we're going to see like a yearly sort of i guess focus on a realm and and specific you know special core battalions you know various um abilities enhancements and so on uh and and battle plans and all that for that year for that like a season like you do in in, in computer games right in, in competitive computer games and stuff like that you know you get a season and you get um a whole sort of theme around that and then m most most computer games do this right they'll, they'll have this like seasonal thing and so it looks like we're getting that for for um warhammer and i think that's really good because it means the meta is going to shift every year and the focus is going to be different every year and it means that you can't get players always dominating all the time they're going to have to be chasing that that dragon you know chasing the meta um a little bit too and so that you're going to get you know maybe maybe a bit more level playing fields because you're all going to be learning together and that can that's fun it means more dynamic all that sort of stuff and we're going to see different rules different units becoming strong some becoming not so strong and uh, and yeah that's great that just means that more of the stuff you buy more of the models that you have can potentially be you know, a player in the game and not just not see any game for like 10 years, you know, like some units just never, ever get good because their core structure. I've told this in another, in the hobby chat about, you know, um, I think it was the soul bite one I talked about, um, you know, my thoughts on that. And, you know, one of the things in design, like you want that core structure to be good. Um, and, and as I said in that, in that video, you know, I would prefer army books to be a little bit stronger out of the gate and then peg them back than, than have them sort of mediocre or in that fat middle to begin with. Because when you're dealing with that, if it's coming out at the start of edition, like that soul bite book is, it's going to be nowhere near competitive by the time we get to the end, you know, especially if everything is changing every year on top of that as well, you know, 
have they, because they obviously haven't thought about all of those rules in the next coming years, they've got probably a map and a game plan, but they don't know all the ramifications of those rules they're going to put in place and how that affects early books. It's probably not going to go so well for some of those some of those early books that come out. So, you know, that's just a thing, right? And, and, and obviously there'll be FAQs and different stuff to try to beef it up. But, you know, if that core structure isn't, isn't really good, then <clears throat> not to say that Solvite isn't good, but just using that as an example of something that's more sort of in the middle in terms of a book and, and it's going to have issues, you know, two, two years down the track before, you know, as we come closer to the end of this edition and move into a fourth edition, it's probably going to be struggling. And, you know, other books that you that you see that come out a little stronger, they stay strong for a lot a lot longer set of time than just that initial release and you know those few months after. And I think that's just better. So you know, for me anyway, I prefer that. But you know, um, what that means is is there might be really what I'm talking about here is units in your books that might have decent kind of structure but don't really quite fit in currently in the meta, they may become better as we move into sort of like for instance flesh eater courts, the horrors aren't exactly as great as the as the flayers because of the the Ren thing and so on. But they do have the damage too, I'm pretty sure, on the horrors. So, you know, a unit like that that might end up becoming like it's still decent, but it's but it, and it has like a good set of like base like stats, but it just doesn't quite fit in because of the way the meta's going. But that could shift and allow that that damage to profile to become more important than let's say the the rend potentially probably not but you know that's just one like small example of where a horror might become a a, a good choice unit in certain circumstances over let's say a flayer um, so you know there, there, there's all that kind of stuff and and minutia um, you know changes that you might make to your list to make them more viable uh, year to year now which is really cool so it's not just like one one or two builds for a few years and then you move or change armies or whatever you might be able to play the same army year to year and have new builds fresh builds each year maybe who knows so they're all really cool things about this game that i'm really liking so um you know there, there's a lot of ramifications there for a lot of stuff but yeah i like it so let's move down to before i keep waffling on forever and this becomes like a five hour video let's um let's move down to to this stuff so one other change that i saw was you know obviously the predatory spells they're moving in each phase so i as i said i haven't played any of these AOS games yet, so I've only watched them and obviously, you know, slowly gotten my, myself acclimatized to this game. But from the outside looking in, this seems pretty powerful. Having something moving around the board every every single phase, like, you know, multiple times a turn, seems pretty powerful. So, you know, I won't spend too much time on this. As I said, there are better, better channels out there that'll get into more detail on this, but that's giving like a whole nother level of tactics that are being played in the magic game with these things and, and forcing a lot of choices that are being made. So, you know, again, another layer of meta game and, and tactics that are being employed really like it. Um, just while we're there, the priests there, um, you know, if we just come down a little bit, the priests here, you know, they, these guys are getting a chance to like, um, uh, dispel spells like unbind spells or whatever. I think it's on a, yeah, like it's a high, it's a hard roll, but I think they get a chance to sort of like negate magic now, which is great. That helps them out a lot, right? So you, if you don't have a wizard in your army, you can still sort of counter the magic thing. And that's one of those key areas, as I said, armies, like I said in the beginning, armies that can play in every phase are the ones that generally are the best, you know, because they're, they're playing more of the game. If you're limited and you can't do that, you generally suffer. Um, unless you've got very good rules to counter that in other phases, you're, you're going to lose out a little bit. So now that priests get some of that utility and there's some good chance and some good like invocations or whatever they call them um, for these guys that might be really, really good. So things like Corn, you know, their priests, they can now do a little bit of counter magic play. I mean, there's even an artifact in there that's like a, a, a tome that you can give a give a hero that makes them a wizard. So I, I'm sure Corn's going to get an FAQ that says you can't take that. But for the moment, until they drop an FAQ that says that, you'll be able to take a um, a, 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 a Corn wizard now, which is hilarious to me. But you know, um, that's that's just that's just that's just really funny. I'm sure that won't last, but you know, it's cool right there's there's some differences there some new things that you can do so i, I love all that um as i said yeah the prayers the invocations here we've got the different different stuff you can do um and, and they're all really cool changes so i like all that so it's allowing you to play again more phases of the game more things happening um and, and for me for my money that's 
that's the thing I like. When I first started getting back into this and looking at, at 40K and AOS, you know, the simplicity of that early days of AOS didn't really catch me. Like, you know, I've said this before, you don't really get into this hobby because you want simple. I mean, let, let's just be honest about that. You might dream about wanting things to be a bit simpler and all that sort of stuff, but really our brains like complexity. It's it's like something we like, you know, that's why we stick with this for so long. Otherwise we playing computer games. Um, you know, th there's something about that, the, the endless possibilities, the constant, you know, that, that, that's why games that have a lot of, a lot of, you know, deep meta in them generally are, are things that people always go back to. If you look at like, um, uh, you know, Caves of Card, right? The, the, that old school uh, game that's been going on for forever for like more than a decade or whatever, right? Um, if you don't know what that is, go look it up on Steam. Um, but I won't go too much on it. But, you know, that's that's been worked on for so many, so many years that it's got tons and tons and tons of stuff in it. And so people go back to it all the time. Um, you know, games that have a lot of that. That's why Magic's lasted so long because they just keep adding to it, keep adding to it, keep adding to it. There's so many different uh, combinations and ways. And people like all that. That's, that's, that's what they like. Human beings love that complexity because it just stimulates your brain in a way that nothing else in life really does, right? Like there's, it's a very, very particular type of complexity that you don't get in normal everyday life and our brains really need that it's something that they like to dig into you know what i mean and 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 you don't realize how much you love it until you start you know go all in and like dive in deep and then you realize that you know as confusing as it might be um it's it's highly stimulating on, on multiple levels at least people that love this type of stuff and i'm assuming if you're in the hobby you do love it and so just enjoying that complexity is part of the fun you know because that means every time you play you're going to learn something new every time you play there's going to be a new experience it's not going to always be exactly the same every time you go down so the the more of these kind of layers of tactics that they can build in and the skill cap gets higher and higher that means that you've got a bigger journey to go on you know from start to finish and i like that so for me this is a positive move you know, as I said, there are certain little things about, you know, old days of fantasy and older stock um, versions of 40K and so on that I really enjoyed that I wish was still in the game. But um, I do like the level of effort they've gone to for one clarity for the for the, the rules themselves, uh, for both games, really. And, um, you know, and, and just the level of complexity they're able to get in while still keeping things relatively streamlined. It's a very, very hard thing to, to juggle. Very, very hard. And the fact that you've now got two major game systems that really have probably the best rules each that they've ever had, you know, that's a huge achievement. Like, it's just amazing how Games Workshop manages to hit hit those, those nails on the head uh, for all of their faults and all of the times they blunder. Like, when they get it right, they get it right. You know what I mean? And, and you know, kudos to them for keep 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 on pushing it because, you know, this is this set of rules here and the the ninth edition one is a great achievement for a for a gaming company. I mean, you know, if, if like I make games myself, like I've got my own brand, Blight of Gods. You'll see the link in the down there. Um, I've made a card game for that brand. You know, and and trying to keep everything together and keep everything balanced, even in a small smaller game like the one I've made, it's very difficult. You know, you, you put one false thing in, you, you change one word, you do one thing, and it can just have such a, a accumulation effect across the whole game. Like multiple things can just be totally altered by one change that you think is simple and you don't think, you know, in those broader terms, suddenly you've affected everything. And so to be able to come through, look, they've got all these little side notes here that let you see, you know, when something like give you examples and so on and try to make it as clear as possible it's so hard to catch everything like it really is and and i think they've done a really good job this is a good core structure for this game moving forward um and, and i think it's going to be heaps of fun to play like once you get over the complexity of it you know you're and you just revel in that you're, you're going to have a lot of fun your army building is going to be good good times your your games are always going to be interesting you know and if they change that meta you know the, the the generals pack each year with a new realm or a new you know focus and give you new new little things to add in and, and shift around new core battalions and so on to 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 that everyone gets access to that to keep the level level playing field you're going to have such a great time i can't i can't see how that's going to be bad you know like um let's come down to so staying on the, on that topic um we'll see where we got here we should have the battalion stuff coming up i think or have i gone past it i don't even know now where are we uh here we go yeah so we'll 
let's just have a little bit of look at this. So this is this is really what I'm talking about. You know, the um, the core battalions here are are really what keeps the level playing field, and hopefully they make sure that any new core battalions that they bring out, everyone has access to. The biggest thing that they could do to, to put it back in into the previous edition is to give specific sort of battalions for match play that only are available to one army. That's that's the big problem. That's what you've had in the pre in the in previous generations of the game that I've that I've watched. I can see that. Um, anything that's like that always always puts one army book well above everyone else. You know, um, Zinch is an example of that, right? Their, their war scroll, their, um, their battalion in their book is awesome and it's what gives them that edge. Well, now they're going to be brought back a little bit because of this, because now they don't get quite the level of bonus that they're getting. Um, this is still very good. And all those, as I said before, all those armies that are flexible, good shooting, good range projection, like for their damage, are always going to be good in this game um, because of the way it's structured. However, those extra little buffs that they're getting and those extra synergies, they're not going to get. They're going to be on the same level of synergies and so on as everyone else. You're going to have to like think about your army a little more and figure it out. And that's what I'm hoping we see going forward. Um, just as a side note, as a lot of those channels have already talked about, you know, you're one dropping here, this battle regiment is the only way to get the one drop. So, you know, most, most competitive games, you're going to be looking for a one, a one to four drop, I guess, or maybe one to five drop. So you're either going like the battle regiment and this command entourage to get your either command point or enhancement. So extra artifact, um, or you're going the warlord one and the regiment for, you know, the command point and the extra artifact. But again, remember that you don't get one drops for any of these others. You're only getting the one drop for the battle regiment. And so you're looking at either a five drop in this configuration with the warlord and battle regiment, or you're doing a four drop with the command entourage and regiment, um, or you're just sticking to battle regiment or possibly two. Um, there is also argument for possibly like a, a battle regiment and a vanguard, but you wouldn't really do that because you, you need this extra, extra artifact specifically because there is... There is now one where you get a like a five plus board save, so that's like your DPR or your your um you know you feel no pain, and um, that's really really powerful for a lot of armies that that can really use something like that, and so you're probably going to want that extra artifact for sure. So you're either going to be doing this combo or that combo. So, but you know. There is an argument for if you don't need that extra artifact, if that's not important to you, uh, then just doing the one drop because having the choice to either go first or second is is a big deal, and and it still is. And there's you know whole lots of reasons why you want that. So yeah, I think all of this is really cool. Um, I'm not going to go too much more into depth on any other areas because um, yeah, as I said, we'll be here for five hours, and there's much better channels that go through all this in more detail and, and spell it all out for you. I'm just giving you my initial thoughts on this and what I think moving forward and and how good it is. And I do think overall it's a it's a really cool game, and I'm and I'm excited to play it. And you know, I, I think um, armies that have access to good monsters and stuff like that, monster builds are probably going to be pretty powerful over the next year at least. You know, so flesh eater courts are looking pretty good, uh, especially if you can give something that, that five plus ward save as well. Some of your big uh, your big characters or whatever that'd be great. Um, you know, other other kinds of things. Although I think they might already get something like that anyway. But you know, there's there's a whole lot of stuff there that could be really good for them. All their monsters are going to do um, get extra points. You know, for doing certain things in in in, uh, in missions and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty good. I'm liking it. Uh, and also the Stormcasts. I've been enjoying painting them, and they're awesome too. So I, I've got a feeling that Stormcasts, as I've said before in other videos, you know, Stormcast are going to. If, if Games Workshop are smart, they're going to make them the Space Marines of, of fantasy. So they're going to be really efficient, you know, really good point for point, um, lots of options, tons of different ways you can play them. Um, they'll have good shooting, good MSU style units, good good combat, good everything, access to all the different elements of the game. So magic, fly, you know, monster, everything, all the stuff, you know, behemoth, all, all those different units, they'll have a good variety of them and they'll all be as efficient as they can make them so that they're not necessarily the top, top one, but they'll always be like a, like a, 
like a good S tier or you know high tier uh, choice because that's how they are in 40k you know, Space Marines. They're no matter who's on top, Space Marines are always in the meta. They're, they're never out of the meta. They're never like a bad choice. They're always a good choice, and that's what they need for AOS. You know, to keep this thing, you know, give it that strong identity. And I think, I think, you know, with the look of those new models and all that sort of stuff, um, Stormcast are looking to be that that type of army. And I think that that's cool. I think that that's that's strong for the game. It helps something else to anchor everything else off of and bounce against and so that you you get that you get that thing so basically so new players can play something and actually you know have some fun and maybe win a game or two because you know you, you don't want to like yeah it's it's just it's just it's cool you think of those 12 year old kids that are coming in you know at least then you know they've got their stormcast there they're going to have some fun. You know, they might actually like do, do something cool and have, have a cool time and, and, and get that experience of getting the exhilaration of having a win, you know? And I think that's a fun thing. It's not all just all about us old guys playing this game. There's also a bunch of kids that play this. Um, you know, I used to work for Games Workshop back in the day and, you know, a huge portion of your customer base are under the age of 15, you know, and, and, and they need to have some fun too. It's not just all about us old guys. So you got to think about that too. This game is for everyone and for a, a broader spectrum of the community than just, you know, the, the, the hardcore match play guys and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, just something to consider, but I think it's going to be really, really great. And I'll stop waffling on now. If you have actually managed to listen to this to the end, thank you very much. Um, but the analytics probably tell me that I'm speaking to myself right now, but anyway, that's all good. If you have listened, fantastic. Thank you. And uh, please hit that like button, subscribe button. It really helps me out. And um, yeah, I guess we'll see what happens going forward. And um, I'll uh, catch you on the next one.